Hello, hello, people. It's time for uh, carbohydrates. So we're only going to do one day of carbohydrates, and then we're going to move into metabolism. So after this video, you should be able to define key vocab terms, and there are a lot of them. This is a great opportunity for flashcards. Food for thought. Um, you should be able to draw a Hayworth representation from a Fisher projection and vice versa. Identify the glycosidic bond in di, oligo, and polysaccharides. Um, list two functions of oligosaccharides. Oh, oh I've got functions in there twice. Whoopsie, ignore that. Um, identify representations of polysaccharide of the polysaccharides amylose, amylopectin, cellulose, glycogen, and chitin. Those are the um, polysaccharides that you should have memorized by being able to recognize their structures and define their functions. Um, compare the functions of the above polysaccharides based on their structures. Um, compare hetero and homopolysaccharide structures and match carbohydrates with um, three functions, energy storage, structural support, and cell signaling. Okay, even in this list of learning objectives, there's a ton of vocab. So hopefully by the end of this video, you'll also know what those words all mean. Okay, so um, I've kind of got this organized. We're going to go from small too big. So we're going to go from the monosaccharides and different ways of representing them um, to disaccharides. We're going to specifically focus on sucrose and lactose. Um, oligosaccharides, which are mainly just the signaling. Um, and then the polysaccharides, and there's two flavors of polysaccharides. There's homopolysaccharides, which means that the repeating unit is the same. And then there's heteropolysaccharides, which means the repeating unit is different. Okay. Okay, so main um, important functions for carbohydrates. There are three of them. One of them is energy storage. Or we'll call this, this is for metabolism. Um, carbohydrates can also be used for structural support. And then they can also be used for signaling. And I'm hoping this list looks familiar because these are also the three functions of lipids, energy storage, structural support, and signaling. Okay, so we got to start with the basics um, and the absolute basic definitions of what is a carbohydrate. So carbohydrates are polyhydroxy. Polyhydroxy, which means many OHs. And they can be either aldehydes or ketones. Okay, so you're looking for something that has many OHs. Almost basically every carbon probably has an OH on it. Um, and it's either an aldehyde or a ketone. And this particular representation um, is called a Fischer projection. And the horizontal lines here are coming um, out and away from you, or coming out, um, uh, how do I say this? Towards and behind the plane. And then the straight line down the middle is in the plane. This is a really common way of representing um, a carbohydrate is using a Fischer projection. So if you look at this, you'll notice that there are, in this particular diagram right here, there's only one stereocenter, so one chiral carbon. And in this one, there are no chiral carbons. Okay, when we move um, from a Fischer... and it gets cyclized, these are called Hayworth. And they have this specific look to them. They're never going to be the, the uh, chair or boat formats. Um, they're going to be in these very specific structures that look like this. 
or like this. So those kind of um, cyclic structures. And these ones in particular are called furanoses. Okay, this suffix O-S-E means it's a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates are also called sugars. Okay, and the furanose means that it will make a five-membered ring. And not all, just any five-membered ring, it will make a furan five-membered ring, which has an oxygen right here at the top of some of you call this the house structure. Um, makes a, uh, an oxygen right at the top there. So furanoses are five-membered carbohydrate rings with the oxygen at sort of the peak of the five-membered ring. And you'll notice that the numbering starts usually, uh, well, the numbering starts, I can't always say at the top because we could rotate it around. It starts nearest to the, the ketone or the aldehyde. So this is carbon number one, two, three, four, five, and six. And if you'll notice, this is also a ketose because it's a carbohydrate that is a ketone. And then over here, the numbering goes um, clockwise around the ring. And we'll talk about how you get from a Fisher projection to a Hayworth very soon. Okay, if the carbohydrate is a pyranose, again, OSE indicates it's a carbohydrate, um, then it's a six-membered ring. that is the f of the form of a pyran. So glucose, right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's an aldose. This CHO is the aldehyde, um, condensed form. It's an aldose. Um, and when it cyclizes, it makes a six-membered ring with this oxygen over here. Typically, it's up in that upper right-hand corner. And the numbering again goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and that is clockwise. And let's see, is there anything else that I want to say about this before we get to cyclization? Nope, I don't think so. Okay, so how do you go from a Fisher to the Hayworth? So the wherever the carbonyl carbon is, that's going to be your electrophile. And the OH that is the, I'll call it the last stereo center OH, stereo center, is the nucleophile. It turns out this very last carbon at the end here is not chiral typically. Um, so this is the last, this OH that's attached to carbon number five is the last stereo center. So this OH um, is going to attack this carbonyl carbon, push these electrons up, um, like it's shown here, push these electrons up, and then this will grab a hydrogen probably from water um, or, uh, yeah, probably from water. Okay, so we're going to practice doing this, but there's a couple things that I need to point out. Carbon number one that gets attacked here is also known as the anomeric carbon. So there's another piece of vocab for you. And the OH that is formed can either be what I call down or up. If it's up, it's beta. And the way that I remember this is from... Um, one of my undergraduate biochemistry professors would always say um, batter up. So you know that beta goes up. So if it's a beta pyranose in this case, the OH on the anomeric carbon, which is carbon number one, goes up, which means the alpha goes down. Okay, and before we get from moving um, between Fisher and Hayworth and back and forth, I wanted to give you this tree uh, that I had to memorize at one point in time, way back in the day, which you will not have to memorize. But what I want you to see is that it starts out fairly simple. 
and then as you go you add a carbon each time and just keep flipping the stereo centers. Um, so these ones, this number right here, um, the OH is always on the right. Okay, always on the right. And then to change to a different sugar, you can flip the stereo center and get a brand new molecule. So these is always on the left, to the left, to the left, and again, to the right. And then you just keep adding and adding and adding and adding, um, and it gets kind of crazy. But again, you don't have to memorize this, but I want you to see that you can create the, there are tons and tons of sugars because you get a new sugar every time you flip the OH from the left or to the right. The other thing I want to point out is these are all D sugars, which means the, the last stereo center, the one that's up from the bottom, is always on the right. So if you look, you'll notice that this OH here is on the right, on the right, on the right, 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 right. They're all on the right. They're all on the right. If these were L, this was like L allose or L glucose, then this OH would be on the other side, and L literally means left. All right, so let's do, um, we're going to practice these. So you don't have to, again, you do not have to memorize any of these. You'll either be given a Fisher or Hayworth and asked to go back and forth. So let's do a couple examples. We're going to do a ketose, and we're going to do an aldose. All right, so let's see, what did I pick? I picked mannose. I picked D mannose. Again, you don't have to memorize these. I will give you either the Fisher or the Hayworth, and you'll have to move from there. So mannose is an aldose. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and then it goes OH here, OH here, OH here, OH here, H, H, H. H. Okay, so the first thing that I recommend you do is I recommend that you number your carbons so that you don't lose track of them. So again, carbon number one is the one that is closest to the ketone or the aldehyde, um, but has to be at the start of the chain. So this is carbon number one, this is two, three, four, five, and this is six. Also, just so you know, there's one, two, three, four stereo centers or chiral carbons in this molecule. Food for thought. It is going to be the last stereo center OH that does the attacking. Okay, but what I want you to do before the attacking is I'm going to have you rotate this 90 degrees to the right. Okay. 90 degrees always to the right. Always, always, always. If you go to the left, you will mess this up. Okay, so when I go to the right, that puts these ones up and these ones down. I'm not going to draw the other hydrogens. Just please know that on the opposite side is a hydrogen. Okay, so now carbon number five. So again, a number one, two, three, four, five, and six. So carbon number five, the OH on carbon number five, um, is the one that is going to be the nucleophile attacking the carbonyl carbon. This one will go up and uh, grab a hydrogen from, let's say, a water. Now, this means that I will have um, I will have a um, one, two, three, four, five six-membered ring, which makes this a pyranose. I'm going to put my O over here, draw my pyranose, number my carbons, one, two, three, four, five. Carbon number six is always coming up and out. So here is number six. Now I'll tell you whether I would like you to draw alpha or beta. So in this case, um, let's say we want to do alpha D Manos. Okay. Um, batter up, beta is up, which means alpha is down. Now the reason that we rotate 90 degrees to the right is because they're already in the, the up or down that they need to be. So both on carbons 2 and 3, they're both going up. 
instead of down. And then carbon number four, the OH, is going down. Ta-da! So that is alpha D mannose. And again, remember that this carbon right here is anomeric. Is the anomeric carbon. Okay, we're going to do a ketose just because I want to make sure that you've seen examples of both. So I picked um, this goofy one called tagatose. Have you ever even heard of this? My guess is that you haven't. Okay, so CH2OH, ketone, straight line, CH2OH, and then one, two, three. I've got two OHs on this side and one OH here. I'm just going to go ahead and automatically rotate this um, 90 degrees to the right. That puts all these up, up, and here. And then I number my carbons. So there's the, the carbonyl carbon, but I have to start at the end of the chain. So that makes this one one because it's closest to the carbonyl. That's two, three, four, five, and six. And then it is um, the OH on the very last stereo center, the one furthest away from the ketone that does the attacking. So this will attack here. Those electrons will go up to that and grab um, a hydrogen from water. So you'll see that we have um, one, two, three, four, five members in the ring. One, two, three, four, five members of the ring. So that makes this one a furanose. So the O goes here. Okay. And this is actually carbon number two now because number one is up and out of the ring. Okay. And we'll say we want, uh, oh crap, hold on. Can't draw that yet because I haven't told you if I want alpha or beta. So let's do, um, let's do beta, beta D tagatose. Tegatose. Sounds goofy. Okay, so beta means it's the OH that's going up or down, not the CH2OH. So beta, batter up, means the OH is going up. So the CO, CH2OH is um, on the opposite side. Three and this is three, this is four. Three and four are both going up. And one, two, three, four. This is carbon number five, which is attached to that O, which is this O right here. And then this one, I, I usually just have it going up and over, and I just, instead of drawing it completely out and condensed, I put a skeletal structure there. So again, this is carbon one, to two, to three, to four, to five, and to six. So tagatose is a ketose. Um, it's also a furanose. And in this form, I have it as beta because that OH is going up. All right. Okay. Um, so those are monosaccharides because it was just one sugar at a time. And sucrose is a disaccharide. Di meaning two. And it's a disaccharide of fructose and glucose. Okay, what I wanted to point out here is that the bond that connects them is called the glycosidic bond. And mostly I just want you to be able to recognize this and draw an arrow to it. You don't need to be able to draw um, this. There are many different flavors of glycosidic bonds, but basically it's the bond that connects um, two sugars. Another common disaccharide is lactose, um, which is a disaccharide of galactose and glucose. And again, here is this glycosidic bond. 
and you'll maybe you notice that this one has this kind of um, zigzaggy shape whereas the one before had a U shape so again there are many different kinds of ways of connecting these sugars um, but they always have this oxygen in the middle and they're always consider and they always connect um, more than one sugar together okay so remember the suffix OSE represents a sugar and the suffix ASE represents an enzyme and lactase is the enzyme that hydrolyzes or breaks the, glyc the glycosidic bond between these two sugars. Breaks apart lactose into galactose and glucose. So if we're going in this direction, it's lactase. That should help do that. And a lot of people, lactase production in the intestine decreases after childhood. Um, so as adult, adults, they can't digest um, lactose, but their intestinal bacteria can use a lactose. This usually results in bacteria tend to have these byproducts that are gases, which um, tend to make people gassy. Um, so it turns out there's a mutation in chromosome 2, which some of us have, that delays the shutdown of lactase production. So there is a selective advantage for children um, to be able to break down lactose because of, um, as infants, they need to get milk from their mother and they need to be able to break it down into the different... Um, uh, blub, 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 into the different monosaccharides, but as adults, uh, you may not need to drink milk anymore. But some people, some people um, are adults and can drink milk, which makes you kind of like a mutant because you have a mutation, which delays the shutdown um, of lactase production, which basically there's two there's a double negative in this sentence, which means you get continued lactase production, which means you can drink milk into adulthood. And this was also a slight advantage. Um, and it's an example of recent human evolution. So I thought, but like, maybe I could write all these words. And then I was like, I'm just going to read this too. Um, so mutant humans um, are able to digest milk products into adulthood. This mutation appears to have occurred independently in several population groups. 80% of Europeans and Americans of a European ancestry have this mutation, i.e. they can digest lactose as adulthood, which makes you X-men and X-women. Um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, this percentage is very low. It's absent in Bantu of Ban Bantu, oh man, I hope I pronounced that right, of South Africa and most Chinese populations. Um, and the appearance of the mutation seems to have paralleled the domestication of milk-producing animals. And this is my gratuitous opportunity to have a picture of a cow and a goat in biochemistry slide. So it was a, of a survival advantage to be able to digest milk in adulthood if you were living in an area where they domesticated milk-producing um, critters. Okay, well, that's all. All right, so we're moving on to oligo. Um, oligo it's, are polysaccharides um, that are between 3 and 10 units of length. So they're more than a disaccharide, um, and they're less than our really, really long polysaccharides. So they're somewhere in between the little and the really bigs. Okay, so um, these oligosaccharides tend to be attached to the membrane in two different ways. They're either attached to the glycolipid, or they're attached, um, or they're either attached to a lipid, calling them a glycolipid, or they're attached to a protein, calling them a glycoprotein. So a glycolipid is an oligo, oligo, oligo saccharide. Yikes! Covalently, covalently attached to a lipid, like exactly how it sounds. And a glycoprotein is an oligosaccharide covalently attached to a protein. Okay, and these are called glycoconjugates. So two examples of glycoconjugates are glycolipids and glycoproteins, and you'll notice that these are on membranes, and they're on the outside of the membrane. 
Okay, and there's a reason for them being on the outside, and what? They're missing down here. Why are they only on the outside? So you, if you want to think of your cell like um, an M&M an &M where the outside is nice and crunchy, that's where all the sugars are. I'm going to come back to this. The reason that all the sugars are on the outside is because these oligosaccharides are important for signaling. Okay, so the sugar code, they literally call this the sugar code, is on the outside of cells. And it's a really intricate code because, I like this figure a lot, it's pretty, muscle purple. Um, so it's a really intricate code, meaning the messaging is very specific because of all the stereo centers in the saccharides. Okay, so you can get a very specific message because we have lots of different stereo centers. Um, a couple of different kinds of proteins that bind to carbohydrates are uh, lectins and antibodies. Okay, so here is a lectin. It is a protein that binds to a sugar. It is not a glycoprotein. Okay, it is not covalently attached. It just binds to a sugar and sends a signal. Again, antibodies here. Um, they're also not glycoproteins because they're not covalently attached, uh, but they do bind to the sugar code on the outside of a cell, which causes other things to happen. Um, you can get cell-to-cell uh, -cell signaling this way. Bacteria can recognize a cell. Viruses can recognize the cell. Um, like I said, other proteins can recognize the cell just by binding to specific sugars that are on the outside. Again, think of your cell as being like an M&M where the outside is a crunchy coating um, where all the carbohydrates are. Okay, I don't know what's going to happen if I go backwards this slide. I don't think that's going to work. Let me see, let me see, let me see. And the reason that all the sugars are there, hmm. Okay, I have absolutely no idea if this worked. I just moved one slide that I had forwards instead of backwards. Um, but what I wanted to show you is how um, a glycoprotein uh, um, is made. So how is it that the carbohydrate is attached to the protein? So the carbohydrate is attached to the protein um, either through a serine, a threonine, or a tyrosine because these all have OHs on their side chains. Okay, so you can get an attachment there or through an asparagine or a glutamine um, through the amid backbone. I'm sorry, through the amide side chain. Okay, so it turns out the oligosaccharide conformation on the outside of red blood cells gives rise to the different blood types. And they all have this N-acetylglucosamine. So that is this structure um, right here. This is acetyl. Okay. This is the amine part. And the glucose is um, the sugar part. So they all have an N-acetylglucosamine. And then followed that, they have a galactose followed by a fucose. So here's galactose and here's fucose. And you'll notice that the, the arrangement of the OHs, ups and downs, um, are all different, which is what gives us different sugar molecules. But it's this piece up here that differentiates O to A to B. So O has the basic pieces of A and B, okay, um, but not the unique N-acetylgalactosamine. So again, acetyl group, that's this one. The amine, that's the NH, and then the galactose is the sugar part. So um, type A has N-acetylgalactosamine, and type B has the galactose. And I wonder if you can figure out um, 
why O is the universal donor, and why A and B are just a lot more picky. <laughs> okay, um, this is just another picture of sort of the same thing. I don't know why I still have this in here. Okay, so we're moving on to polysaccharides. So these are more than 10 um, monomers linked together. And we have two flavors of this. We have homopolysaccharides and heteropolysaccharides. And if you're getting a little tired of me saying saccharide or gluc, glac, glic, this would be a good time to just pause, take a break, um, go do something and come, and come back uh, when your brain feels a little bit more refreshed. But homopolysaccharides are repeating uniform monomeric sugars. Again, homo meaning the same. And hetero um, contains two or more different repeating um, structures of the, yeah, two or more, blup, 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 <laughs> I can't talk, um, two or more sugars that have different structures and they're in a repeating chain. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about homopolysaccharides and we're going to go through those that are energy storage and those that are structural support. The signaling ones were the oligosaccharides. Okay, so we're going to start with plants. Plants store glucose in a polymerized form of starch. Starch is made up of two things. One is amylose. Okay, amylose is highly unbranched. Highly unbranched, how is that? That's not even a thing. It's just unbranched, um, and it's water tight or water insoluble. Okay, so here's an amylose. It's just a repeating um, chain of glucose, and what you'll notice is that all of these are identical in structure, and that's what makes it a homopolysaccharide. So it's homo because they're all the same, poly meaning many, and they're all saccharides. And then the other flavor um, in plants is amylopectin. Okay, and amylopectin is branched and it's more water soluble. And it's also a homopolysaccharide because all of these structures are the same, poly meaning many, um, and saccharide meaning that it's made up of sugars. And amylopectin can have over a million glucose units. So it's a repeating um, glucose polysaccharide. Okay, so starch is made up of both of them. Okay, not just one, but both. And because of their different structures, they have slightly different energy storage functions. So amylose, turns out it makes this like um, helical shape. I don't know why I'm trying to draw it. It makes this really long helical shape, whereas amylopectin doesn't quite fit into a nice helix. But amylose packs together really, really nicely. Um, and is used for long-term energy storage. So amylose, uh, because it's just a one long chain uh, and it takes up less space, it's good for long-term energy storage. Whereas amylopectin, it has many end pieces, so it is degraded more quickly, um, and it, this is more for quick energy uh, release, but we'll call it quick energy storage. Okay, and you'll notice that when we get to animals, not plants, um, but in animals, our long-term energy storage is a tag, which is a type of lipid, okay? Plants, I don't know if you notice this, you probably wouldn't classify them as being fatty or having lots of fat on them. That's because they're made out of carbohydrates. Um, and so their energy storage is primarily all carbohydrates unless you're talking about the seeds, um, which do have, that's where the fat part comes from for plants is the seed. That's energy storage in a tiny space. Um, but because plants are not fatty, they're not primarily fat, they store a lot of their energy long-term as amylose and not a tag. And then their quick energy storage is amylopectin. So for animals, our quick energy storage is called glycogen, which is a sugar. 
So glycogen is the animal form of glucose storage or sugar storage. And it is even more branched than amylopectin. Okay, lots and lots and lots and lots of branching. And so here's the structure um, of glycogen. It is anchored by a protein in the center, and then everything else coming out here um, are all the different uh, glucoses and hopefully the glucose polymers so that you can see that it is a homopolysaccharide. It's all glucose. Many, many glucoses. Obviously, there's more than 10 here, so it's not an oligosaccharide. And glycogen can hold up to about 50,000 glucose units. Glucose is stored primarily in the liver, and it's, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a whole bunch of these little kind of black dots, and those are called rosettes. And that's because glycogen um, expands out into this flowery kind of shape. Um, you can also store some glucose in skeletal muscles, but most of it is stored in the liver. Now, glycogen takes up an incredible amount of space. And so once space has run out, excess glucose, once you run out of space, will be converted into fat and stored as a tag because it takes up a lot less space. Okay, question. Why is it advantageous for an organism to store glucose as a polymer versus free glucose in the cell? So this is sort of the same thing as why do we tie up all the fatty acids in a tag instead of leaving them um, as free fatty acids. So in this case, you have a whole bunch of glucose and I'm going to just draw a few of them. Wow, drawing these fast looks even worse than I imagined it would. Do to do, do. Down, down, up, down, up. Okay. So why not just leave all the glucoses as free glucoses and and why does the cell tie them all up in a glycogen? Well, it turns out it takes a lot of water to solubilize. So you can imagine all of these hydrogen bonds. It takes a lot of water to solubilize all of the glucoses. So tying, tying them all up into one giant structure reduces the amount of water needed to solubilize. But again, once it gets too large, once you have um, reached your glycogen capacity, then the excess sugar that you eat will be turned into a fat to be stored as a tag because that is a lot smaller space and you can get a lot more energy per molecule um, in a tag than you can in glucose. Okay, so this is a comparison of the fuel storage or the energy storage forms of carbohydrates. Amylose is the most long-term storage and then it goes down here to short term and the reason that it takes the glycogen as the shortest time to depolymerize is because it has so many free open ends here so if you imagine I don't know some enzyme that acts as like a lawnmower just going off and chopping all of these ends it's a lot easier to do because you can access so many open points on a glycogen Whereas amylose, you got to go one by 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 one. So amylose is best for long-term storage. It's water insoluble. You can get a lot more glucose per molecule stored. Whereas glycogen has lots of branch points, so it's best for quick, quick, easy energy. Okay, so now we're moving on to another um, homopolysaccharide that is for structural support. And this one is cellulose, and it's in plants. 
And if you'll notice, again, all of these are the same. That's what makes it homo. They're all poly. It's poly because there's many, and they're all saccharides, so it is a homopolysaccharide. Because of its um, linear structure, the cellulose chains pack really close. And look at all these hydrogen bonds. It's kind of insane how many hydrogen bonds are here. But the more hydrogen bonds you get, the um, increased strength. So cellulose is really, really strong. And what I mean by structural support is cellulose is what makes up like the bark um, on trees. So it helps the tree grow really, really tall by being able to be super strong to hold it up. Now, most, or no, I won't say most, I will say some organisms, let's go this way. Some organisms um, can digest or eat cellulose like this really cool mushroom here, this fungi, uh, but humans, we can't. We cannot. And I wonder if, if I were to give you the enzyme that this fungi, let's isolate the enzyme, and give this to you in a way that you could use it, would you want, would you want to be able to eat tree, trees. Hmm, I wonder, would you want that? I don't know, we could probably trust it out and try it. Maybe not. Okay, um, another homopolysaccharide that is used for structural support is called chitin. Chitin, chitin, not chitin, like kitten. It's chitin, like fly kite. Um, and chitin is another homopolysaccharide, meaning it's made of the same subunits. Um, but in this case, they are N-acetylglucosamine. So again, here's the acetyl group, here's the N, and here's the glucosa. It packs just the same. Okay, and is very water insoluble. And the reason that you know this is because chitin is what makes up the hard shells of a lot of crustaceans and bugs. If you've ever stepped on a bug and heard that crunch noise, that's chitin. Um, and you'll also notice that um, these crustaceans, they're obviously water insoluble, and it's the chitin in their exoskeleton that keeps them so um, water insoluble and tough on the outside. Now, what's my question on this one? Which is stronger? Cellulose or chitin? So if you'll remember, cellulose is a polymer of glucose. So there's an OH here, an OH here, something tied up there, and an OH here. So I'm just going to say this goes on and on and on. So what's different about the two is this functional group compared to this functional group. So which one is stronger when the chains pack tighter? Well, this is all hydrogen bonding. So this is like finally like your absolute greatest wheelhouse biochem. All the carbohydrates do with each other is hydrogen bonding. Um, so when you pack a homopolysaccharide together, all you're going to get is hydrogen bonding. So we have three H bonding opportunities here. We can donate one from this OH. And you can accept two for each lone, one for each lone pair. The N-acetylglucosamine, we can uh, donate one, accept one, and donate two right here. So chitin is stronger because you have four hydrogen bonding opportunities instead of three. Meow, meow, meow. Okay, um, medical uses of chitin. So chitin is being explored as a possible surgical thread and bandage materials. Um, for one, um, it's biodegradable. So there are some enzymes in your body that will chew this up. So you can uh, use it as a thread and then it would degrade on its own. Um, and because it's watertight, it might be able, if you use it as a bandage or a gauze, might be able to accelerate the healing of wounds. If you know or think about or remember, depends on where you're at, uh, that most burn victims, they're, the greatest threat to them is bacterial infection. Just roll with me on this one. Okay, 
So burn victims, their greatest threat is bacterial infection. Bacteria can only grow where there's water. Whoops, bacteria gene? What is that? Come on. Bacteria and water are very happy. If you put a gauze that is watertight, then you have the possibility of decreasing the amount of bacteria that are growing, um, and therefore the wounds heal faster. So um, chitin is not yet being, like, marked. I think they're still, like, doing trials. You can't, like, buy the surgical thread right now. Um, they're still testing it out and figuring out how, how to best use this. But I thought I'd give you another example um, that is health sciences related and not necessarily related to crunchy bugs. Okay, and then my last one, my last example, I have to give you an example of a heteropolysaccharide, and honestly, it kind of took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do for this. It takes me a while to figure out, find a heteropolysaccharide. So a hetero meaning the monomers have to be different. Okay, so the one that I found is from this bacteria, Xanthomonas compestris, and you'll notice that the sugar coating on this bacteria, the units of the sugar are different. So that's what makes it hetero, okay? It's poly, meaning there are many of them, and saccharide because they're all saccharides. And it has a kind of an interesting story. So this is the sugar that makes up xanthan gum. And you can buy xanthan gum at almost any grocery store now, or you can buy it online. It's actually relatively cheap. You can get, like, a bag of it for, like, $10. And people use it to, to bake with and to make things sticky, like, literally gum, or, like, you can make your own, like, Twizzler pull and peels and things like that. Um, but its story is actually kind of interesting. And so is isolated from these bacteria, and this is two bacteria that are literally stuck together because these bacteria, when they grow, um, they make this really sticky, um, I don't want to say this, not solution, um, colonies, I guess. So they, they're kind of, I don't know, sticky, snot-like. And so someone went in and tried to figure out what makes these bacteria so sticky? Like, why do they always just stick together? Sticky. And they figured out that it was the carbohydrate coating on the outside of the cells that was causing them to be so sticky. So they isolated the carbohydrate coating, and they realized that they could do some really interesting things with that carbohydrate polymer, like make gum, um, twizzler pull and peels. I'm trying to think of other examples. If you look at food labels, you'll see that xanthan gum is actually in a lot of things. Um, the other reason that I picked this image is because the caption is written in Spanish. You all have to take Spanish, and I did not take Spanish, but I think I can, like pretty much get most of this. Something about the photograph via a mi oh, an electronic microscope of the bacteria, Xanthomonas compestris. Um, I'm not sure what that says. Uh, do it, blast bacteria. Ooh, un flagello polar. Okay, so it has a flagella. This is my favorite um, structural feature of bacteria is that they have uh, flagella. Typico of, I'm guessing that it has a polar flagellum that is typical of its genus. And the bar represents one micrometer. Meter. That just gives you the size and scale of this. Okay, so <laughs> this is probably a really long lecture. Um, a lecture talk, video, whatever I'm doing now. And just as a reminder, we started out with the mono and then we went to disaccharides, and then we went to oligo, and then we went to the two types of poly, which were hetero and um, homopolysaccharides. And goodness gracious, I hope that's all I have for you. I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.